Hi everyone, welcome to October's update video on my solar generation and electricity usage. Uh, yeah, the big change for October, the weather. I mean, just look at it. It's misty, it's thick, it's raining, it's horrible. It's been like it for most of October. So what are the stats like? Just as a reminder, and in case this is the first time you've watched one of my solar videos, we've got 22 panels on our roof and it produces a maximum of 6.3 kilowatts. We installed two separate arrays. The first one was 14 panels, 280 watts each, with a maximum output of 3.9 kilowatts. And then later we decided to add some more panels and a second inverter, a solar edge inverter. And that was eight panels and they were 300 watts a panel, generating 2.4. 2.4 and 3.9, that's the 6.3. Inverter wise, the Solar Edge is a 2 kilowatt inverter, the Solace, our original one, that's a 3.6 kilowatt inverter, so in total 5.6 kilowatts is what I'm going to get out of the system, even though the maximum the panels can produce is 6.3. Okay, so for the month of October we produced 375 kilowatt hours, and that's from both arrays. And that compares favourably to March's numbers of 380 kilowatt hours. Although March, as you can see from the graph, with just the one colour, was only our first array. In October, it's the combination of both arrays together that equal the 375. So, yeah, March was a good month, October was a terrible month. Looking at the day-by-day -day analysis, you can really see how bad the month was. The amount of days that we're under 10 kilowatt hours being generated from both arrays collectively. Some days, not even one, under one kilowatt hour being generated. So it doesn't matter how many panels you have on a really dark, dull, rainy day, you're not going to get much generated. But interestingly, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days there over 20 kilowatt hours. So when the sun does come out, now that I've got two arrays, still getting some good generation. So if we add those numbers to the main chart where I track my energy usage and solar generation, that's the orange line for solar generation. You can see we've got a massive, massive drop from the summer months now to under 400 kilowatt hours. But also we can see a drop there on the red line. That's the amount of energy I'm using uh, to heat my hot water. That's dropped. Uh, I think that's because the summer holidays are over and our daughter's gone back to school. And then also the green line, that's me charging the car. So we have consumed less energy charging from solar into the Kona Electric. You'd think heating our hot water and charging the car would be a constant number, but because I'm trying to use just solar energy, the less sun there is, the less charging we do and the less heating of hot water we do. And depending on the day's requirements, depends on which I give priority to, charging the car or heating the water. The reality of all these dull days without so much solar energy is that we have had to have the oil boiler on a few times to heat our hot water and also to heat the house. It has been cold enough now to have the heating on for a few days. And the same for charging the car. We have actually visited a few chargers, free chargers in multi-storey car parks in Norwich. And we also visited a Hyundai dealer in Bury St Edmunds and we charged the car there, adding about, oh, what was it, about 40% state of charge. Grid usage for the month, we've consumed 85 kilowatt hours, and that's an average of roughly 2.75 kilowatt hours per day drawing from the grid. September was only 68, and August 133, and my previous video sort of explained why we had more in August. So go back to this graph, the blue bar chart there is for grid usage, so adding in October's number, you can see that we did have a couple of months there in the summer where we were using more grid energy, and that was before we put the second solar array in and before we put the eddy solar diverter in for the hot water. Okay, on to car charging. Our Kona Electric, we travelled 890 miles in October. We achieved an average efficiency of 5 miles per kilowatt hour, so slightly down from the summer months. From the Zappi, I can see that I've charged 130 kilowatt hours into the Kona this month, but only five of those came from the grid. So 5.27 times 13 pence a kilowatt hour, that's my energy tariff. That's cost me 68 pence this month to do 890 miles. I had three public charging sessions this month, uh, two at multi-storey car parks. The first was a 7 kilowatt Type 2 charger, and I think we added about 14 kilowatt hours. And the second charge at the multi-storey was only a 3-pin 2.2 kilowatt charge, and we only added 4 kilowatt hours, maybe 3, 3 to 4 kilowatt hours. 
We also visited Turner's Hyundai in Bury St Edmunds and sat on their 7 kilowatt charger for probably 4 or more hours, so we added a good 30 kilowatt hours, maybe a bit more to the Kona. Luckily those public chargers were available while we were out. We didn't go there specifically for the charge, it was charging while we happened to be in the city or at Bury St Edmunds. So without those chargers though, which were free, we would have had to charge more from the grid I think. This chart shows two pieces of data. In orange it shows how many kilowatt hours we charged at home on solar and you can see the gaps there where there's none. Well those are on the really dull days where we didn't add any energy to the Kona from the uh, Zappi charger. The blue line that shows our state of charge. So the 10 line that's 100%. So you can see at the peak of the blue that's around 80% dipping down to just around 40% at the lowest point, but then we were able to charge at Hyundai Turners and uh, got the charge back up to 80% on that particular day. The reason for doing this chart is simply that it shows the frequency of charging, how often we're charging at home from solar, and also it shows how we're running the state of charge of the Kona. And you can see here that ideally we're floating mostly between 70 and 80% state of charge at the end of the day, and the lowest we ran it to this month was around 40%. And that's typically what I'll do. You know, I don't mind if it's 40, 50, 60, 70, 80%, none of that matters. But if it's down to 20, I need to charge, and if it's over a 90 or 100, well I need to drive it. And on to our hot water usage. So as you can see here, on average we're using 3.8 kilowatt hours per day to heat our hot water. For the entire month of October we used 105 kilowatt hours. And I did check again and the daily numbers did add up to the value of 105 this time. So I'm really not sure what happened last month with the addition where it didn't seem to be quite right. Putting that into context, uh, looking at this graph again, the red line is showing how many kilowatt hours we're adding to our hot water via the Eddy solar diverter. And you can see, yes, it is a very low number, but several days we had to have the oil boiler on to heat the hot water. So maybe that's why the number is lower than it is in other months. Looking at the My Energy app, the grid usage number, that looks wrong. We know we consumed about 85 kilowatt hours and this is showing 102, so that's not accurate. But the numbers here that I'm interested in are the consumed generation of a 306 kilowatt hours and the exported generation of 59. So what percentage is that? That's about 84% consumption, so only 16% exported to the grid. And this is where I'm questioning the value of a battery to me. Yes, I would benefit from a home storage battery and I would enjoy it and it would reduce my amount of grid energy. But if you look at this chart here at the bottom, the amount of yellow showing export, they're the uh, spikes that generated the 59 kilowatt hours of solar that I exported to the grid. Could I have used those if I had a battery? If we zoom in to a specific week in the month, we can see here more clearly that we only exported for the entire week 2.9 kilowatt hours, and you can definitely see there are no spikes of yellow, so there's no exported energy, hardly any. So on the first day there, you can see a lot of red, so that would have been a lot of more grid consumption, so the battery would have been used. Depending on the size of the battery, it would have exhausted itself this week, and I wouldn't have been able to recharge it. I'm going to use the next few months over the winter here to determine how much energy we are exporting to the grid and what sort of battery and what size battery might benefit me the most. From this month, it's sort of looking like I'm going to need, well, if I'm using 2.75 kilowatt hours on average a day and five or six days here where we were um, running very, very low on solar energy, so five or six times that, it does look like a Powerwall 2 sort of size is going to be the ultimate solution for me. But I guess that's a no-brainer, isn't it? What you need is the biggest battery possible that you can afford, and also what you need is the most solar panels you can get onto your roof. The more you have, the better you will be. So how much do I need to get to completely being off-grid? I don't actually think that's possible here. There are always going to be unique days where we're going to run out of energy somewhere. So if we have a look at this uh, app here on my mobile phone, this is the Solar Edge app, and it's showing here in green the graph of my generation of that array. So that's eight panels, eight 300 watt panels, a 2.4 kilowatt P array on a Solar Edge inverter, and this is the view that Solar Edge gives me. 
So on the first of the month, we generated 2.69 kilowatt hours and spiked there in the middle of the day at nearly 1.45, 1.5 kilowatt hours. Sorry, kilowatts. On the second, 10.3, that's a good number. And a good, a good example to say is in the summer, I'm expecting this array to generate between 14 and 15 kilowatt hours a day. So to get 10 on an autumn day in October, that's pretty good. With the lower number of hours, the sun is actually shining and the lower um, orientation of the sun. So we're not getting quite as much sun through, even on the best sunny days. On the third, only 5.5, 4.6, 5. 5 243 watt hours now this is one of the lowest for the month so you can see there was virtually nothing all day and then a spike in the afternoon where there was some sun so the cloud and the rain did clear from the scale at the left you can see that though although there was a spike in the afternoon it was only at 150 watts just 1.9 on the 7th 6 6 8.98 2.6 1.5 1.24 Yep, that's uh, four days in a row now, really, really low. 1.1, that's five, two kilowatt hours, so nearly a whole week without a lot of sun. 17th was seven, and the 18th, 5.9, 19th, just eight, 20th, 3.95, and now coming up the change on the 27th of October, the data looks completely different. So what's happened here? What I've done is installed a watt node meter, that's uh, an additional box that basically connects a CT clip to the main supply at the house. And that gives me import and export numbers from the house, feeds that then into the solar edge inverter and combines it with the generation data, sends it out to the web, and I can see it all online. Now, the problem with this that I've noticed is, yes, it's more colorful. Yes, there's more data. The import number is accurate and the export number is accurate. Um, it's really good from that perspective. But the self-consumption numbers here aren't accurate because it's derived. It's seeing how much I've generated, seeing how much we've exported or imported, and then presuming that the bit missing in the middle is how much you've uh, consumed of that generated electricity. Whereas in reality, it's more than that because I've got a second array, a second array that this solar edge inverter can't see. So it doesn't know how much I produced in solar energy and therefore it doesn't know how much I really consumed. It's just guessing at it. And that for me makes it limited. So was it worth the £200 to install it? Probably not. Looking at the week view on the Solar Edge app, this is a uh, Again, it's a, I think it's a little confusing, really, because you've got all these different bars, and what are we really looking at? Well, the red is always higher than the green and blue, so what we're showing there is the amount of energy we are consuming, and the difference between where the red peaks above the green, that's how much we're importing. The difference between the green and the blue, that's the amount that we're exporting, and therefore the blue is the derived amount of what's missing. How much did we actually consume? Going back to the My Energy app, the reason this is better is because it's got another CT clip. It's got one looking at the house import and export, but it's got a second one that's looking at my solar generation. And I've been able to put the CT clip in a position where it is monitoring the output of both solar arrays. So the number here of exported generation and the consumed are much more accurate, even though the grid energy, as I said here, isn't quite accurate, it's not as accurate. So the CT clip isn't as accurate as the one from Solar Edge. And the same goes for looking at this day. This day is interesting on the 28th of October because you can see the uh, blue was increasing in the morning. I think that's where we're heating the hot water, but then you've got just green. That's where the hot water was up to temperature, but we were out and therefore the Kona wasn't available to charge. When we came back, we plugged the car straight in and then we get more blue again, so we're consuming. And then later in the day, we've obviously got some red spiking, so we must have been cooking when there wasn't a lot of sun. Looking at the My Energy app for the same day, the first thing to notice is, well, it was slower. Um, it took a lot longer to get the data up on the screen. There was a bit of a delay, probably 15, 20 seconds. And uh, also the grid energy isn't the same. 2.5 is showing on the Solar Edge app, 2.8 kilowatts hours on the My Energy app, so slightly higher again. 
But the data itself is effectively the same, especially the import and export. But the way my energy app is representing it, to me, is a little bit better. I like this graph where you've got the green spike of the generator's electricity, but the yellow below the graph showing you what you're exporting. I think that's more visual and better than the solar edge way of showing it, which was just whether it was blue or whether it was green. Okay, that's it for October's data. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it made sense. I hope I described it accurately. Uh, it's still foul weather here, so let's hope for better weather in November and December. No more changes planned for me. Uh, the watt node meter was the last change in the configuration, so it should just stay consistent now. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you again soon. Bye-bye.